Hey guys, welcome back to the shack. I've got most of my projects caught up. I've got all the equipment testing that I've got to do for right now done. And many of you have asked for this video. So guys, I hope it's beneficial. I hope you like it. Uh, but tonight I'm going to be going through some of the basic fundamentals of light burn as I know it. And just disclaimer guys, I, I don't know everything there is about light burn. I learn every day just like you guys. Now, I function on a daily basis in light burn and I get a lot of projects done, a lot of jobs done. So I think I'm pretty well versed at it. So the object of tonight's video is not to make you a professional, no light burn inside and out. Uh, this is to get you started. If, if you're somebody who is just getting in the light burn or if you're trying to decide if you want to get in the light burn, this is for you. Now, some of you guys has had it for a little while. There may be some things in here that you didn't know existed or you overlooked, I find those things daily. Uh, there's some little things and tips that I'm gonna go over. I just wanna give you a good working knowledge of the software so that you can get into it and start having fun and making things with your laser. So if that's something you're interested in, stick around for a minute and we're gonna move to the computer and get started. All right, guys, welcome to the laptop. And uh, just to get you started, uh, many of you, if you have an X tool, you'll have Laser Box Basic and X tool Creative Space. I hardly ever use those those guys. Uh, but we're going to go down here and I'm going to open up Lightburn for you guys. This is a project that I just got through working on. So we're going to go ahead and move that out of there and uh, update that overlay on the uh, Acer P20. Uh, the machine's not powered up right now because it's a little noisy and I wanted to try to keep the audio from being overwhelming uh, during this video. So one of the first things that you're going to need to understand about Lightburn is guys, you can run multiple machines with Lightburn. Now for those of you that have multiple machines, but let's say you primarily use uh, one machine over the rest. The way that you would set that is you would come here and select that machine and then hit make default and what that's going to do when you launch Lightburn, it's going to automatically load the profile for that particular machine that's very useful if you're designing files and that's your primary machine because some of these other machines will flip the graphics and stuff like that uh, on you so i keep mine set to the Acer because it's pretty much my go-to for most things uh, so i'm going to leave that set there to set up a machine, uh, you're going to use the fine laser, and I've got some videos on that, so we're not going to waste a lot of time on that. You're going to use the fine laser button uh, at times. Uh, most of the time, it'll find the machine that way. If not, you may have to do it, create manually. Now, if you're doing tumblers and a lot of things like that, one thing that I will recommend uh, in these settings right here, you're going to have to select uh, what system you want it to use to operate. Uh, pretty much the garble is going to be the standard. Some of the old, other machines, some of the older machines, you know, you may have to get down in here in some of these. But most of the machines I'm seeing now come out just operate just strictly off of garble. And, uh, of course, Ethernet or USB, the majority of the time you're going to want to go with USB. This is where you name the machine. Uh, it, if, you, if you, you know, have a special name, you can do that or you can just use the model. That's what I do. Uh, this is also where you set the X and Y axis. Uh, for you guys that have extended machines, I do want to let you know that this only affects light burns interpretation of the workspace. Uh, if you extend your workspace, you're going to have to go into the controller itself and change some settings in there to get that to operate correctly. Uh, and then, of course, home settings. I recommend not having this on uh, because it never fails. You'll have something sitting in the workspace or you'll be trying to set up a tumbler and you'll power the machine up and, and it'll try to home. So I started out using this, but I've slowly learned that it can be more trouble than it's worth. So I leave that off. And that's pretty much all of the settings. And I'm not going to affect any changes on my machine. Uh, once you get into light burn, guys, I would strongly recommend your first stop go in and here to the settings. Okay, there's a few things that have been asked of uh, folks have been asking about, and I want to kind of point some of these things out. First of all, make sure 
if you need it, use beginner mode. But I recommend just dive in there, guys. Go for it. Uh, so make sure your beginner mode's turned off. Uh, the millimeters per second or uh, millimeters per minute, that to me is a personal preference. Some folks like millimeters per minute. Some folks like millimeters per second. But whichever you choose to go with or whichever you're comfortable using, make sure you select the appropriate one uh, here in this in this area. Uh, some of these settings here are pretty helpful as far as snapping to objects and snapping to grid when you're designing. But for the most part, I find that they annoy me uh, when I'm not doing, you know, designs. Uh, these are the settings that I like for the movement keys. And I'll show you later on how those keys work. But these, these give you a fine, really fine adjustment. And then you've got the other adjustments when you're moving things around your workspace, trying to get uh, everything to frame. Uh, but that's pretty much on that page. That's going to be the basic stuff that, that I would recommend. Uh, the second stop you're going to want to make is go into your device settings. Now, these are actually, for those of us who use uh, the, the laser diode itself to frame, these, these are very important. Uh, you're going to have to make sure that you enable right here where it says enable laser fire button. And you're going to have to click this one where it says laser on when framing. Okay. One thing that I use a lot and I recommend it, you don't have to do this, but you might want to try it, is set a return to finish position, guys. Uh, my return po to, to position on this machine is basically five millimeters in from the top left corner, the way my machine sets. Uh, and that helps me to improve upon accuracy and consistency when doing multiple objects because once i home and i frame the machine and i make sure everything's where it is it never touches a limit switch it never bounces off the rail it just goes to this position i load more material and then send the next engrave and it cuts down a lot on having to go back and reconfirm of uh, the frame uh, i've gotten now to where if i'm burning like 50 or 60 engraves i I frame the first time, and then after that, it's just reload, start. Uh, a lot of machines, I've had some people complain that their machines would not operate at 100% capacity. So you're going to want to glance at this on your way through and make sure that that is set to 1,000. Uh, some of the, the Acers have been set down to 250, as well as some of the other machines. Uh, kind of glitches, I guess, when you're connecting it to Lightburn, and that can uh, that can coincidentally end up at 250 which is only a quarter power and you're not going to want that typically these are going to be set up when you add the machine uh, this is the usb transfer to the device and i wouldn't go messing with these if you're not having any issues just leave that alone that should be correct uh, once the machine connects uh, to the lightburn software so those are the big things that I like to make sure are set. Uh, one more thing that has been come up has come up lately is you have different options on your work bed. Okay, when you put a logo or a design in the workspace, the way I like my machine set up, uh, anything that is engraved is going to be this darker color, and if it's a line, it's going to look it's going to be a line. Okay. There is a setting up here uh, in the uh, window that you can change to a wireframe. Okay, wireframe makes everything looks like a cut. Looks like a cut. I, I I don't like that. You may, but I prefer the field smooth. That's that's the settings I prefer. Now, I guess if you had a computer that couldn't you know couldn't handle the graphics, which today that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, maybe that would come in handy, but I really don't see why anybody would not want them shaded. So when you go in here, if yours does not look like this when it's a fill, then go up here and check to make sure that you don't have it set to uh, wireframe because wireframe makes everything look like a line, and just it's just not very uh, not very useful. All right, so the art library. Uh, the art library, I do have a video on that, so we, I'm just going to touch on that. Basically, this is a place that you can create kind of a directory for all your designs, uh, different folders, things that you reuse or you use on a regular basis. I've got my little file design folder. This is different things that I make 
Uh, I just have those dumped in there. Some geographical stuff. I mean, logos for some of my, you know, my customers, myself, and some of my friends. And then just random outlines and things. Uh, these are texts that I have created. And it's just easier to get to those guys and drag them over here uh, if I'm doing a different engrave than it is to go searching for them in the folders. Uh, now, if you don't have this showing on your screen, anytime you're missing one of these windows, guys, go right here to where it says window. And you can actually make that go away or you can go to window and you can bring it back. So if you're not using it, if you don't need it, you can turn it off and get it out of your way. It makes your workspace a little bigger. Uh, same thing with any of the other things that are here. I don't recommend moving <laughs> these guys. Uh, I would I would leave those on. Uh, pretty much the only one that I consider optional is the art library. And because sometimes you just don't need the art library if you're designing a burn or something like that. It just kind of busies things up. So we'll leave the art library off so that you can see the screen a little better. Uh, and we're going to kind of go in and walk through the camera stuff okay cameras and light burn are very very useful guys i mean you can see my workspace here uh it, it is very useful to have it is a tool but it is not 100 percent so uh just know that the camera will help you align things it does make sure that things are proportionate it's a pretty good indicator of whether you have room on a piece of scrap to be able to cut from it if you want to throw it in there and, and test it that way but always frame and double check behind the camera. Uh, that's just word of advice. Uh, no matter how accurate it seems like it is that day, always double check. But some of the other features uh, that you're going to need to know, like I said, with the camera, and I, you can see I've got several different cameras. I don't know why the Elgato is showing up on there, but uh, but it is. Uh, this camera is the one that's on the laptop. I mean, pretty much any camera can be brought into the light burn. Uh, these sit USB 2 cameras and the HD USB cameras, those are the ones that I have in my enclosures, and I, those are the ones I like. Uh, typically, I've got to where I run the fish eyes everywhere now, uh, just because of the versatility of them. Uh, with the camera, you can do a trace feature as well as you can also line up pieces. So let me throw something in there to do a trace right quick, just so that you will understand how that works. So I'm gonna put my, my little micrometer in there, or and we're gonna use the trace feature, all right? And so, you have to play with this. It's not 100% all of the time as far as being able to trace something. You want to try to get it to where you have a well-defined line around whatever it is you're tracing. And a lot of times you can get it to where you can make that shape. And it's pretty cool. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And as you can see, I got I got a pretty good line around it, but it's it's kind of broken. So it takes some it takes some play and especially with the honeycomb. Now, if you want to put something behind it, a lot of times that'll get a lot of that noise out of there and you can actually get a little better image. So let me do that. So I'm just going to put a piece of wood in there so that you can kind of see what we got going on here. Let me delete that. All right, so now I'm going to do the trace again. And obviously I got a lot cleaner image but it's still not uh still not ideal but you can you can shift these controls here and try to get that a little cleaner uh looks like about right there so we about as clean as it's going to get so now you can see that i actually did manage to get let me turn that into a feel so you can see so you can see i managed to actually get the majority of it uh if i were trying to cut a you know cut a little hole out in, in, a, in a piece of wood to place this somewhere that would probably work um but that's the trace feature guys and i don't use it a lot but i have used it a few times and it is actually pretty handy uh, like i said but you can spend a lot of time trying to get this perfect so if you're not looking for perfect you may not want to spend a whole lot of time Oh, while we're at it, I will put my art library back over here. 
And I'm just going to, let me open up one of these. I'll just open that one. That doesn't have anything in it right now. And so if you want to bring something that you traced and you want to save it in your art library, select it. Make sure the entire thing is selected. You can do that by dragging this uh, box around it. Or if you drag this way, if it touches the line, it's going to select it. This way will only select anything that you completely, if you have to completely circle whatever it is you want to select if you go this way. Uh, if you go this way, however, any line that it crosses or touches, it'll select it. So another little tidbit. Uh, but so make sure everything is selected. Click on it. And then you're going to go to Import Graphic from Project. And I'm just going to name this Trace. And hit OK. So now, in the event that I do a project tomorrow and I decide I want that image in my workspace, you just drag it over here and drop it. And you can do that with any of the things in your art library. So you can just drag and drop until your heart's content. Go over, select everything, and hit delete, and they go away. So that's that on the trace feature. Uh, the other one, like I said, being able to use it to build files and so forth is pretty handy because you could actually go in here and you could say, okay, I want to make something and I want to make it this big. And you can you can actually create a box in here, change it to a tool line, and now that is not a cut. That is merely a tool line. And you can use this little circle frame, rubber band frame button here, and it will actually run this frame and show you where you are on the workspace with that. And that's really useful if you're trying to center something on a piece of material. You can draw a box like this on that material and then you can frame and if it runs the edge of the material where it is indicated that it will on the camera, then all you have to do is bring whatever it is into the workspace. You wanna click on the item that you're wanting to center first. Any of, these, any of these buttons that we go through, anything that I tell you, click and then click this. The one that you click first is the one that's actually going to move. The second one is going to be your reference. So I'm going to click that one, and I'm going to hold control, and then I'm going to click the, the tool line that I created. And this little nifty guy right here is the center button, and that's going to center the logo on this frame, and that's how this works, like that. And so that takes the guesswork out of it, guys. So if you're trying to engrave a bamboo cutting board or something like that, and you don't want to do a whole lot of measurements, you can throw this frame in your workspace using the camera. Make sure that you get it properly aligned with the edge of your material. Change that to a tool line. And then when you bring your graphic in, use that tool line to center, and you'll have it perfectly centered every single time. Now, if you're really resourceful and you have a jig kit, which I do sell on my Etsy shop, when you put that jig kit in here and you set that burn up, you will be able to replicate that. All right, so I got the machine uh, reconfigured. I got me a jig in there. So I'm gonna delete that uh, graphic that we had in there. And I'm just gonna kind of demonstrate what a jig file does and how it works, guys, because this is something that if you're new, uh, you're gonna wanna learn this. All right, so I'm gonna go to my laser files, Go to my cutting boards. These are the files that I use to do my cutting boards with. Uh, I've got configurations for different machines. These are preset jig files, guys. And what this does is I'm going to open this and load uh, the design. All right. You can see the design. You can see that I've used a tool line here as my reference frame. And then I've got the design centered using that reference. All right, watch what happens when I update my overlay, guys. There's the cutting board. Now, there may be, like I said, there may be a slight variation occasionally. Uh, I would just about be willing to bet you that this is exactly correct as far as the machine goes, but the camera is just a little off. Uh, and so what this does is that allows me to frame confirm that my frame runs the edge of the material on the cutting board and as long as it does then I just hit start remove the cutting board place another one hit start and continue 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 uh, this allows me to do 12 or 13 
without really having to do any setup. So that's why jigs are handy. And this is my little square end jig that I use. And then I basically just created this box, just like I showed you guys how to do it just a second ago. Uh, it just makes life a lot easier when you're doing that kind of stuff. Uh, one thing that you can do if you're having problems seeing stuff or if you're trying to, that's unfortunate. Okay, so, huh. Maybe I need, maybe it's time for me to update, guys. My light burn crashed. Never had that happen. <laughs> so, back to what I was saying. Uh, let's see if that happens again. Okay, no, it worked that time. You can actually change the exposure if you're trying to get certain details. You can, you can take it off of auto bright and auto exposure. And you can kind of play with this to get the desired look that you want in your workspace. Uh, and you can see that this is actually a test cutting board. Uh, but if I wanted to use that and do a trace, there you go. And you can play around with that. But cameras are handy. Uh, like I said, not a requirement, guys, but definitely, definitely handy. So enough of that. Let me change my overlay to camera none. Hang on. Trying to clear my workspace. Let me just open a file. That'll do it. All right. That cleared my workspace. Good. All right. So that's my Monport camera over there showing up. So I need to take that and get that off there. That's going to bug me. All right. One thing that I want to go over is text, guys. Uh, one thing about text is there's actually a lot of fonts to choose from in Lightburn. Uh, you've, you've got quite a few, and a lot of times when other softwares will add fonts to your machine, of course, you'll all, all have access to those as well. Uh, this is the size of the font, which most of the time you're not going to be concentrating on this as much as you are just grabbing the brackets and, you know, making it however big you want to make it. Uh, with text, this little blue dot right here, uh, let me see if you can get in there where you can see it. There's a little blue dot right there. You can grab that guy and you can roll the text into a circle. So if you're doing a circular design, you can, you know, change that uh, from you know, pretty much any circle size you want. Uh, it can be it can be tricky. All right. Uh, you can also, if you need to, you can change the uh, vertical spacing and the horizontal spacing, which I've only got one line of text. So horizontal is only one we're going to be able to use here. So those are those are pretty handy. Text is you know kind of basic. Uh, you also have the square tool uh, that makes squares. Now, one thing I will tell you is if you make a square and then you make another square inside that square and it's set to fill, the machine is going to assume that you want to fill the space between those two lines. So if you ever try doing this or you're trying to put two shapes together, uh, there is a way to do it, but it's a little more... Uh, I've seen some people, you know, ask how do you how do you make your letters engrave instead of leaving? Uh, that's basically it. You're going to have to create a frame, put a line around the outside of the the letters there. But another handy tool, and I wrote they did rotate this 90 degrees, is if you're trying to put something together and it just doesn't work, there's a tool for that. All right. First of all. You can click on the one that you're wanting. Like if you want to put these two together, click the one on the bottom and then I'm going to hold control. Remember, the one that you click first is going to be the one moving. So I'm going to hold control. I'm going to click the second one. These buttons here are your alignment tools, guys, and that's going to align the centers of them. So if you wanted this to be symmetrical, you hit that button and it aligns them symmetrically. Now. Even though these tools are limited to making pretty much circles and squares, there are ways to manipulate these shapes and make them into other things. And I'm going to show you that. Uh, with both of the, the this black box and that black box both selected, you have several options. You can trim that one. And like, well, that, stand by. Oh, <laughs> whichever one you select first is the one that's going to be affected by this guy, see? You, you got to remember this stuff, and sometimes I forget. So when I click this, it should like eat a little chunk out of the bottom of that one. 
So if I wanted to make that shape, you know, have a hole here. Uh, let me back up. I'm going to undo that so I can show you another one. Okay. You select this one and select that one, which in this case, it doesn't matter which one you select first. And then this button here will allow you to weld those two shapes together, forming uh, another shape. And you can, you can keep adding shapes to it, guys, if you want. Uh, you can take, select that one, hold control, select that one, center them, go back down here, and you can weld those shapes together too. So you could actually build, you know, pretty much any shape that you can dream of. So I'm going to get rid of this text. So I'm going to go in here and show you a little bit. We're going to kind of dip our toe in editing the nodes on this guy. This button here, once you have a shape selected, this button here will show you all of the nodes in this design. Okay. There's a whole slew of functions that you can use. And if, let's say, if I wanted to make this into a triangle, because we don't have a, we don't have a triangle over here. So if I wanted to make this into a triangle, when you got the node selected, you, you're going to want to get your cursor on that line or very close to it. Pressing the letter M inserts a midpoint between this node and this node. And it's going to be exactly in the center. No measurement required. It's in the center. So then you can come over here and select that guy. Once it turns red, you're manipulating that node. Hit the letter D. That node goes away. Go over here. Select on that one. Hit the letter D. That node goes away. So now we have a nice little triangle so that is how you create triangles uh, in the software and there's a lot of other functions that you can use guys and i'll try to remember to uh, put a link to where you can find those uh, i inserts uh, nodes like if you want to insert one just at a random location i and you can see it just dropped a little dropped a little node there and you can click on it to turn red now so I can do another one, I, and it'll drop another one. If I wanted to put one between those two guys, I'd use M, and it's going to drop another one. So there's the three nodes that I created. You can also, when you're editing these nodes, you can also draw a box around them, select all of them, and then hit the D, and it'll delete them. Uh, same thing with any other function. Uh, you, can, you can select those guys, and then you can create a... Uh, a bit of a like array i guess you could say and delete them all at one time uh let's take for example if i wanted this to be straight and it wasn't straight like let's say i downloaded a file and it has this little piece on here that i don't want then you can technically come in and go through here select those nodes hit the letter d and it'll delete all of them. So you just took that file and now you have made it into a straight line by moving all of those nodes that were circle nodes out of the way. Uh, same thing here. If I wanted to make my arrow pointy, I could go here, hit the letter M. It's going to insert a node right there in the center. And then this is where those shift function and arrow keys come in handy. I'm going to hold shift. And I'm going to hit up, and that's going to move this thing, one of those set increments, up. All right, if I wanted to go further, hold shift, hit M, and I can keep moving that node up. All right, just using the down arrow, that's going to move it one millimeter, the way I've got mine set up. And that's the why in the beginning, if you remember, I told you to set your uh, movements to the 0 .001 and then the 1 and then 10. Uh, because if I just hit the arrow buttons, this node will move exactly straight up and down. So if I'm needing to reshape something, I can just hold the arrow key and make that node go whichever way I want it to go. And so there we are. We have a nice little arrow. And if you want to add more stuff to this guy, it's just as simple as, like I said, you just have to make the shapes, guys. And then once you make the shape, go in. Select everything, center, and then go over here and weld them together. And now I've got, you know, this shape happening. I don't know why you'd want that, but, you know, whatever. Uh, a lot of guys have asked me, too, about, like, 
I'm going to rotate this. This is your rotation, by the way, 90. Hit enter, and that way you can do it with the, the dragging it, but I prefer to use rotate, you know, 90, 180, whichever, 360, because that way I know that this thing stays square, and I want everything in my workspace to be square. So with this, if you put text inside here now, uh, what you're going to end up with on your burn, you're going to end up, whoa, flip that guy right over. You're going to end up with an arrow that is engraved with the text left uh, not engraved. Uh, another helpful little tool that I like to use when I'm designing stuff is this little guy over here, the offset shape. Now, the way this guy works is you can select outward, inward, or both, and then, of course, these different settings. And you can even delete the original object. Now, for this application, I'm not wanting to delete the extra. The, the other object so i'm going to change that i'm going to just put a one millimeter let me change it to 1.5 and then i'm just going to hit okay what that does is that basically takes that line and because i have out only selected that's why i have this void here uh, but it, it sets another line out from the original line now if i'd have done both directions on that go in here hit both 1.5 hit okay uh, 1.5 is going to be a little much. Let me back that back down to like 0.5. Hit OK. And it's going to throw the line to the inside. That got a little, that got a little screwy, but it, you know, it worked. So that is very helpful. Well, it's because I did it on top of the other one. There we go. But that is very helpful when you're trying to outline things or you're just wanting to replicate something. Uh, I use it quite a lot. So, especially if you want, and you could take that and you could change that second cut. You could change it into a line. And now what you're going to have is a layered cut. You're going to have an engrave with a line. And then, of course, your layers over here, whichever layer is up top, is the one that's going to go first. So, this is going to engrave first. Then it's going to cut the line. Uh, and that's kind of. You know, that's how you control which one goes first is in the layers. So just remember that. Uh, we didn't go over a whole lot of the stuff in power settings. So let me throw something in the workspace here. And we're going to go over power settings. Speed and power, pretty straightforward. All right. Uh, speed is how fast it travels. It's going to either be millimeters a second or millimeters per minute based on how you set it up in the beginning when we first started setting up light burn. And of course, maximum power. This uh, constant power mode, most applications, you're going to want to leave that off. Uh, the only situation I have found is with the CO2, there are some times that uh, cutting some materials that, that I have to leave it on to be able to make the cut in the corners because it's a translucent material. But for the most part with the diodes, I leave this guy off. Uh, over scanning, that, that is basically uh, the lines, how far they're going to over scan each other. Uh, 127 is kind of default. 200 is about as high as I go on uh, normal circumstances. And when you change that, it's going to change your line interval. Uh, as well. Uh, these settings, there, there's a whole lot of science-y stuff goes into these guys. Uh, I recommend a, a test to see which one you prefer, which one you like, uh, before you determine how you want to do that. Uh, these are very helpful. Uh, this allows you to feel all the shapes at once, especially like with text. Uh, you can feel groups together, so if you've got some stuff that are close together, uh, that it can kind of work together on and minimize white space. That works really well. Uh, feel shapes individually. That's probably the most uh, time consumptive method you can you, you can use. Uh, typically, I'll go with the groups uh, because that way, if it's doing text, it'll do one line of text, then go to the next line of text, or maybe to another design. Uh, the scan angle is this guy. So when you're looking at your workspace. However your workspace looks, these lines tell you this is, like if this was going to be burned, the laser is going to go up and down this way to make the burn. If you change the scan angle to zero, the laser is going to go right to left to make the burn. Pretty much zero and 90 are 
the only two that I ever fool with. If you do have an engrave and let's say you're running in scan angle on zero and it's going to start and it's going to make it halfway through it and you lose power and you're trying to go back and start over again, then you will sometimes want to change this to 180. That way you can change the, the direction it's coming from. Typically that'll change the starting point and you can kind of let that thing run until it meets where it left off at and uh, can kind of salvage the engrave sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. Under advanced uh, flood fill, that's handy at times, uh, but just make sure that you know what the effects on the burn is going to be because it does create some peculiar looking lines in your burn sometimes uh, because what it does, the machine comes in and just whatever angle it can do without uh, creating a lot of white space, that's the angle it's going to run. Uh, it will speed up burns, but sometimes the, 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 the lines in the engrave are not really desirable. Uh, so play with that before you go to jumping into it on something expensive. Uh, another button here, not many machines uh, have this option, but there are some machines that you can actually enable air assist here and uh, have it come on when this layer begins to burn. Uh, I've got two machines that do that uh, and it's pretty handy but not necessary but the other things I guess that I kind of want to touch on it's just going to be these little areas over here guys uh, this is your pass count so if you hear of a four pass cut like when you're setting up a cut the difference in cuts is you've got feel and line that's it now, offset feels kind of a different thing. That's a, that's a whole other creature. Uh, I don't ever use it. If I'm gonna do uh, if I'm gonna do anything like that, I just do an offset line and do it myself. But there are people that that, that believe in offset feel. Not particularly something I use a lot of. It's either gonna be a feel or it's gonna be a line. A line can be as much as a mark, a score, a scratch, whatever you want to call it, or a cut. Uh, that just basically, that's they call it a line. And a line can be a cut, depending on the power settings. So don't let that confuse you. Uh, but when you're doing uh, cuts sometimes, you will have to change the passes. And even sometimes on engraves, you might want to do multiple passes uh, to, to get the desired effect. But this is going to be where you change the, the passes down here. Uh, some of these other uh, little windows here. I have machine positions that I use. Uh, this is my stove cover position. That is basically the center of my stove cover when I put it into the enclosure. Uh, my enclosure acts as a jig. And so I can just send the laser to that location and I know that it's in the center of the stove cover. I can load the design and tell it to go. Uh, this is my parking location, which is the return to location that I use. Uh, and you can go in here and manage those and you can set those positions uh, to where you, you can put as many of those as you want in here. I haven't really seen a limit. <laughs> I haven't never filled the screen up, but you know, you can have a lot of those. Um, and you can use those as reference points uh, if you have jigs made and that type of thing. Uh, some of the older, some of the folks that like the older method of jigging, which is you create a reference point and then set it as origin. And this, this kind of takes the place of that, in my opinion. Uh, I never, I never use these guys. I just use home and these positions here. This distance speed right here, this controls these buttons. Okay, the speed. If you select, if you hover over home, it'll tell you that. What it used to say. Oh, one minute frame. There it is. Right here, it uh, the speed is taken from the move panel. This is where it's talking about right here. So whatever this speed set to. That's going to be your framing speed. So if you find that your framing speed is way too slow for you, you can knock it up here, or if it's too fast, you can slow it down. Sometimes with really small engraves, I have to slow this way down because if not, like my eyes can't focus to see if it's framing properly or not. So I'll slow this way down. Larger items, that's not a problem. I leave the speed kind of fast and go from there. Uh, if you have a rotary, also there's a that's a whole nother creature. But you've got to go into your settings and enable this uh, rotary button to be on your desktop. And uh, that allows you to go in and set the tools. 
One tool, uh, a couple tools that I do want to point out to you are these guys. These are the Calibrate lim Camera Lens and Calibrate Camera Alignment. Those are very useful if you're planning on using a camera. You're going to want to run both of those and set your camera up properly to be able to get the best uh, results from the camera that you can. Also, uh, the material test, I use that a lot. Okay, Interval test, I, 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 don't, I don't play with that thing. Never used this guy, and I'm really not sure what that's for. Okay, so I guess that's only when you have a Z-axis. So I'm really not sure what that one's for. I've never used it either. Uh, rotary setup is right there, uh, and this is definitely very useful, uh, but we're not going to go over that. This, Like I said, I just wanted to kind of give you guys a, a crash course in some of the basic features. Uh, these are your layers down here at the bottom. You can pre-assign different power settings and... Uh, LPI, which if you hear the term LPI, guys, uh, your LPI is going to be, well, first of all, I've got to change that to a field before I can see LPI. That's that's your LPI right there, lines per inch, uh, 127. So if you hear me say 200 LPI, 254, which is probably as high as I'll ever go, that's where that goes right there. Uh, you can also set the number of passes there as well. But it's it's a really, really nice software. One more thing that I want to show you guys that I forgot, and I'm not trying to get into major file design, but this one's a really cool tool that I think everybody should know about is this little guy right down here, the radius. Uh, the radius allows you to take square objects and make them rounded corners. Uh, sometimes with lasers, we tend to just stick with square corners, but this tool will allow you to specify the radius of the corner and make that a corner uh, some of the more advanced stuff when you get into like doing text in circles and stuff like that you're going to want to learn about the uh, setting the start point and that's a whole nother video we're not going to get in that uh, one that you might need for some basic use is the array button right here this guy basically lets you replicate a design and set the distance for how far they are apart and it's it's pretty handy especially if you're trying to create uh, a repeated shape and you can change you can modify all of this uh, all of these settings to get the desired effect it's really handy if you're trying to burn like 20 of a design you can replicate it this way and it allows you to get it lined up make sure everything's where you want it and just just makes life a lot easier than trying to cut and paste and align everything so it's a pretty cool too but guys I, I i could go on for hours about light burn uh i'm running from absolute coordinates uh you can do current position current position has its usefulness uh especially in the world of doing tumblers and doing small items sometimes that is a better approach to framing out your design but for the most part i do 90 percent of my work on absolute coordinates i use the home and i use my jig kits and that's the way I run it. Uh, but absolute coordinates is is very versatile. But like I said, there are those times where you want to use current position. And current position, once you engage current position, the machine assumes that where it is at that exact moment is where you're starting to engrave from. And that's why you'll see this little green dot right here in the middle of the workspace. So if you drag something into the work area, it's going to assume that your laser is shining directly in the center of that graphic. So if you're doing something that is uh, round or square or whatever, and you measure and physically mark the center of that material, and then you fire your laser and you line up the laser with the center of your material, then this tool is really, really useful to make sure the engrave is centered. Now, another usefulness for it is you don't have to worry about the machine leaving this area after it completes the engrave. So if you're doing the inside of a box lid or something like that where it has a lip around it, this will enable you to engrave it and the machine's not going to try to go home or try to go anywhere else after the engrave's over with and makes it, you know, a lot safer. Uh, it's also very useful for tumblers. You can change the location here. And you can set it to where your laser is at the top of the design, your laser is at the bottom, your laser is to the left of the design, or your laser is to the right of the design. And then you can even use these little corners. 
Uh, typically, I stay with center unless I'm doing tumblers. And typically, tumblers, I'll use that left one because the way my uh, chuck orients in there, that just kind of shows me where the very, very top of the uh, engrave is going to be. So, that's just uh, some very basic, like, I don't know, uses <laughs> of light burn, guys. Uh, I, I know I'm probably not as good at this so uh, light burn tutorial stuff as some people, but those are a lot of the features that, that, that I do think everybody needs to know about. Familiarize yourself with these guys. Uh, these are very handy in alignment when you're aligning things. Uh, if, you, if, if you get stuff in your work area that you want to align, I mean, you've got this little button right here which is going to align them along the bottom edges. Now, they're going to overlap each other, but, you know, you've got another one over here, overlap, overlap some on the left edge, which is going to put them on top of each other. But all of these little, little, these little icons up here are really, really useful. Uh, so just kind of play around with those. You've got the, you can actually space things out. You can make them the same height. I mean, there's, there's a lot of powerful tools. Of course, these guys right here will flip them uh, if you need to flip them for, you know, doing a mirror or whatever, and you want to flip the design. Uh, you can you can do that. This uh, right here will take and move the uh, graphic to wherever your laser is, which is useful. And this guy right here just moves it to the center of the workspace. So uh, those are... Like I said, those are a lot of little functions, and guys, like I said, there's 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 thousands of possibilities in this software. We didn't even touch on the navigation. We haven't touched on tabs. Uh, we haven't touched on uh, the measurement tool, which those are things that you're not going to need a whole lot to get to creating things. And the, the object of this video was to basically give you some basic tools and basic understanding and just to feel a little more comfortable about getting in there and using light burn to start creating. Once you do that, and once you've done a little bit of stuff, then, you know, you can kind of play with some of these other functions. There's a lot of tools in here too. Select open shapes. If you've got open shapes in your workspace, and then you can close those guys. There, There's hundreds of tools. Now, most of those you're not gonna need, you know, just getting started. So keep in mind, this was intended for people who've never used light burn, just to give you an idea of what is possible, some of the basic tools, and uh, how to get started. So, All right, guys, so I hope the video was helpful, and I hope you went away with something at least. Uh, a lot of you guys have been asking for this, so uh, careful what you ask for, because I try to do videos that I know you guys want. Uh, so if you haven't already, guys, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, share, follow, uh, feel free to do anything to help stimulate a little growth on the channel. Uh, as people request more, we'll go over more and more in-depth stuff with Lightburn. Uh, there are some really good guys out there that do great tutorials, uh, and I have never really saw the need to uh, to do them, but some folks recently have asked me if I would, so there you go. And I hope it was, uh, I hope it was useful for you. So again, subscribe, like, follow, all that good stuff, guys, and help support the channel. And until next time, be safe and have a good day.